Hello, everyone. I'm Liesl Olson with the Newberry Library. Thank you for joining us for today's program, which is called African American Composers and the Black Renaissance. The Newberry would like to thank the Paul M. Angel Family Foundation for sponsoring this program today. You can visit Newberry.org to learn more about the Newberry's many digital resources, online classes, and public programs like this one. You'll find all kinds of opportunities to engage with our collections, our staff, and stories that bridge the past with the present. Our program today is in conversation with the Newberry's current exhibition, which is free and open to the public. You can visit any uh, you can visit in person uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. The exhibition is called Chicago Avant-Garde, Five Women Ahead of Their Time. And it tells the stories of five women um, who you will see pictured here in a handful of slides. Painter Gertrude Abercrombie um, standing here, I think. Yep, there's the image. Uh, standing here in front of a wonderful painting called Self-Portrait of My Sister which is on display in the exhibition. Poet Gwendolyn Brooks, here she's shown holding her first book of poems, A Street in Bronzeville from 1945. Curator Catherine Koo, who opened the city's first commercial art gallery to sell modern art. There's Catherine Koo. Dancer Ruth Page, who is pictured here wearing a stretchy jersey sack dress for her ballet called Expanding Universe, and dancer and choreographer Catherine Dunham, who we'll talk more about today, and who is often referred to as the matriarch of Afro-Caribbean dance. She's pictured here at her first full-length full -length ballet called Lagia from 1938. This extraordinary network of women, of five women, produced provocative, groundbreaking art and transformed Chicago into a significant site of avant-garde experiment. These five women expressed freedom and expansion in an era marked by discrimination and social division. They crossed boundaries, built institutions, and found support in one another at home in Chicago and well beyond. So I urge you to uh, check out the exhibition, which is on view through December 30th at the Newberry Library, Chicago Avant-Garde, Five Women Ahead of Their Time. Now, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Samantha Ege, who joins us from, um, from England. Um, and I also wanna let you know, there she is, hello, Samantha, um, that during the program, you can enter questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom, or in the comment section if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube. If we have time, we'll have D Dr. Ege respond to your questions towards the end of our program. Dr. Samantha Ege um, is the Lord Crew Junior Research Fellow at Lincoln College University of Oxford. In 2019, I had the true pleasure of meeting Samantha in Chicago when she was a short-term fellow at the Newberry Library. She was then researching Florence Price and Theodore, Theodore Sturko writer's contributions to concert life in interwar Chicago. Her latest album, which I've listened to and which I love, is called Fantasy Neg, the Piano Music of Florence Price. And it features the world premiere recording of Price's complete Fantasy Neg, compositions for solo piano. It's received critical acclaim in the Telegraph, New York Times and Washington Post. And I think, Samantha, you can correct me, but I think you can download it via Spotify. I think that's how I, I um, did it. And I've listened to it a number of times. It's really extraordinary. Um, so we are so, so happy to have you join us today from far, far away. But, um, uh, you know, um, it's really, it's, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you and your work. So I will now um, hand things over to you. Thank you, Liesl, for that wonderful introduction. It is an honor to present on the subject of African-American composers and the Black Renaissance at the Newbury Library via this webinar. I was fortunate to spend a month in the Newbury Library archives during the summer of 2019 as a short-term residential fellow. I was there to investigate Chicago's women composers during the interwar period. 
This particular time frame and this particular city witnessed a remarkable outpouring from a number of African-American female practitioners and a rise to prominence for the composer Florence Beatrice Price. As a Newbury Fellow, I embarked upon a project with the following questions at the fore. What did it mean to be a woman composer in Chicago at this time? What were women's paths to success? Indeed, how was success defined within their own lives? This led to a comparative study that explored what a life in composition looked and sounded like for a prominent black woman composer and white woman composer of the same era and city. Utilizing the Theodora Sturkow Ryder papers at the Newbury Library, I delved into the compositional career of the second generation European migrant composer, Sturkow Ryder, and explored this in dialogue with Florence Price's compositional career and the African American folk inspirations that defined her contributions to American music. In excavating more of Chicago's Black artistic scene at that time, encountering Catherine Dunham was inevitable. Dunham, of course, has featured prominently in the Newbury's full exhibition titled Chicago Avant-Garde, Five Women Ahead of Their Time. And my talk positions Dunham as the entry point into our discussion of African-American composers and the Black Renaissance. My encounters with Dunham in my own research have enabled me to further detail the portrait of Black creatives during this period. While carrying out my fellowship in 2019, it was exciting to see familiar names from the Black classical scene pop up in Dunham's papers at the Newbury Library. For example, in this 1934 program on the next slide, Thank you. I immediately spotted the patron, Helen Abbott, who was the wife of the Chicago Defender founder, Robert Abbott, and herself frequented and hosted many of Black Chicago's musical events. Further down the list, we spot Judge Albert B. George and his wife, Maud Roberts George, another prominent couple from Black Chicago society. Maud Roberts George was a gifted soprano president of the National Association of Negro Musicians and its Chicago chapter, and on top of that was a dependable patron and astute impresario. She in fact underwrote the contracts that led to the Chicago Symphony Orchestra premiering Price's Symphony No. 1 in E minor. This in turn led to the history-making moment of Price becoming the first Black woman to have a symphony performed by a major national orchestra. To see the music of the Black British composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor in this same 1934 program and that of the Chicago-born Black Renaissance daughter Margaret Bonds affirmed the strength of these intersecting artistries. These intersections shape today's talk as we journey through three works. William Grant Still's La Bless, Florence Price's Fantasy Negre, and Margaret Bond's Troubled Water. The influence, impact, and legacy of Catherine Dunham are felt throughout. There was something for every taste and every type of interest in last night's program by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, wrote the music critic Glenn Dillard Gunn of the Chicago Herald and Examiner. The program in question was Ballet Night, which took place on the Friday evening of June 16, 1933, and was the third event in a series of musical programs that belonged to the Chicago World's Fair Century of Progress series. Ballet Night opened with two 19th century orchestral works by the French Romantic giants Hector Berlioz and César Franck. These were conducted by Frederick Stock and, in Gunn's view, very much appealed to the serious music lover. Gunn wrote that, quote, the old fashioned person who believes in artistic aristocracy could find satisfaction in the well-made orchestration of many fine piano pieces by Chopin 
and in the formal and graceful ballet of, from Laurent Novikov's studio that visualized them, end quote. As the Russian choreographer Laurent Novikov and his ensemble delivered Chopiniana, the delicate and decorative style of Chopin's music, in conjunction with the wispy and classically elegant movements of the ballet dancers, would have appealed to traditionalists. But for the moderns, as Gunn put it, quote, there was William Grant Still's Jungle Ballet, La Giablesse, starring Ruth Page and featuring a group of Negro dancers. Gunn continued, quote, this proved to be a sophisticated modern story in which a fair siren led many dusky swains to their doom. If its tragic accents were not too somber, its choreography was brilliantly conceived and expertly realized." End quote. By the 1930s, Still was recognized as one of the most important American composers of his time. Born in Mississippi and raised in Little Rock, Arkansas, Still's musical aptitude was recognized and nurtured from a younger age. His most prominent music instructors included George Whitefield Chadwick and Edgar Varese. Still became known as the Dean of African-American Composers and was a key actor in the Harlem Renaissance, immersing himself in Harlem's rich intellectual and creative scenes. His influence was heavily felt in Black Chicago's classical music community and on a national level too, as he broke several color barriers as the first prominent Black American symphonist, operatist and conductor. Still pioneered orchestral techniques and strongly condemned the racism of the white classical music establishment. Tragically, this led to him being blacklisted. The consequences of this are felt today with the current under-programming of his music. Still wrote Legia Bless in 1927. Its musical language is dreamy and evocative. It blurs the musical sound worlds of jazz, late romanticism and French impressionism and reflects Still's distinct modernist sound. This most certainly was not music from the African continent, but its exotic overtones in conjunction with Still's race meant that white critics typically subsumed the multifarious influences and nuances of Still's aesthetic into a flattened impression of African otherness. In the 1933 Chicago premiere of Still's ballet, Ruth Page performed as the fair siren, La Giablesse, which Page described as, quote, a devilish creature who appears in the guise of a beautiful woman for the purpose of luring the man susceptible to her charms to his death, end quote. Her victim was the character Adu, performed by the African-American dancer Jack Smith, and Adu's lover was Izor, a village maiden played by Catherine Dunham. The opening scene displayed, quote, a little village in the heart of the island of Martinique, with rugged mountains in the background, crude huts down the right and left, and a path up the center, winding up to a ledge in the mountains." End quote. According to the critic Gunn, the music possessed, quote, what sounds to Western ears to be authentic African flavor. It is surprisingly rich in melody, realizes the expected rhythmic impulse, is cleverly set for the orchestra, and was eagerly yet seriously translated into the dance by the Negro Ballet, end quote.
In a review by Herman DeVries, the music critic of the Chicago American, he wrote, the ballet is danced well by trained members of Chicago's literary and dance-minded Negro colony, and very well too, with remarkable understanding of the African atmosphere intended by the composer and the choreographer. The Negro colony to which Devries referred was Bronzeville, the heart of the Black metropolis, a cultural capital in which various facets of Black artistry flourished. And what Western ears or white American ears were hearing was not the authentic African flavor, as Gunn put it, or the African atmosphere, as Devries put it, but the Black Renaissance imaginary, where the question of what it meant to be Black in the United States was answered through imaginings and reimaginings that possessed both forward-looking creative flair and reverence for the past. For practitioners of African descent, and particularly the younger Chicago-born generations, Florence Price's Fantasy Neck unlocked a connection to the past through its Black vernacular influences. At the same time, its formal and technical treatment of these influences offered a vision for the future. Price composed Fantasy Neck in 1929 and wrote beneath its title, To My Talented Little Friend, Margaret A. Bonds. Bonds, aged 15 at the time, was a piano prodigy and subsequently brought the virtuosic piece into her own repertoire. Bonds later became a significant composer in her own right and remained a lifelong champion of her mentor's works and compositional outlook. Fantasy Neg quotes the Negro spiritual sinner please don't let this harvest pass. The piece unfolds as a set of variations on this theme. The spiritual melody where it appears is always orally identifiable. The chords underneath and their rhythms, however, may vary with each iteration.
Price's direct quotation of the spiritual acknowledged her Southern heritage as Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, like William, um, sorry, like as Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas and moved to Chicago in the late 1920s during the age of the Great Migration. She therefore felt that such a background allowed her to claim a true understanding of what she described as the real Negro music. In addition to her black musical idioms, Price also integrated plantation dance rhythms and kinetic evocations in her fantasy neg. These included features that were rooted in West African performance cultures and adapted in various forms of black diasporic dance. Musicologist A. Curry Hill argues that Price's classical engagements with African-American cultural memory are less a break from Black vernacular traditions and more a reinterpretation in the context of Black America. This, Hill concludes, reflects Price's modernist technique and experimentation. Price's reinterpretation of Black vernacular idioms in formal composition reflected ideologies of racial uplift and processes of urbanization through which the transformation of vernacular traditions into a recognized art form thereby became a metaphor for the transformation of the race from the dehumanizing thralls of slavery to the rehumanizing ambitions of free men and women. This metaphor encapsulated the nation's shifting demographics in the age of the Great Migration, and more point, point, pointedly, the coalescence of rural, rural pasts and urban modernities in Chicago. The historian Darlene Clark Hine reveals how Chicago's Southern migrants Southernized the North, just as Black Northerners transformed the politics and perspectives of their Southern counterparts. She explains that, quote, as Southern migrants, as Southern migrants define themselves as urban and Northern in what was a gradual evolutionary process rather than an immediate transition, they helped to propagate a dynamic, multifaceted, modern metropolitan culture." End quote. These processes of influx and exchange among people whom historian and Myers Nupfer depicts as Northern Southerners and Southern Northerners, fueled and shaped the Black Chicago Renaissance. During that period, artistically inclined migrants like Price, to quote Darling Clark Hine, joined native Chicago-born Black expressive culture creators like Catherine Dunham, end quote. From these collaborations arose reinterpretations of Black vernacular idioms from the antebellum South and re-embodied meanings within a modern and urban cultural landscape. In Price's Fantasy Neck, Dunham and her colleagues found a work that epitomized these Black Renaissance Afro-modernist transformations. In December 1932, Fantasy Neck premiered as a ballet that starred Dunham as the premier danseuse. Russian ballet teacher Ludmila Speranzeva choreographed the work. Speranzeva had heard Margaret Bonds perform Fantasy Neck and subsequently arranged it for Dunham's small troupe, a cohort of African-American women called the Modern Dancers. This troupe, which later grew in number and became known as the Negro Dance Group, was Dunham's creation and operated under Speranzeva's direction. The group was founded, quote, for the purpose of bringing the concert stage not only bringing to the concert stage not only the highest developments of classical, modern, and character dancing, but also to express the folk themes and folk ballets. End quote. Speranceva's dance background encompassed the Russian Imperial Ballet and the Khmeni Art Theatre of Moscow. 
Speranziva was, quote, inspired by Miss Dunham's enthusiasm for a Negro ballet and consequently made the realization of this aim a definite part of her dance future, end quote. Fantasy Neg provided the ideal sonic landscape for the world Speranziva sought to reinterpret through dance. As for those who might realize the performance, Speranziva knew that modernist trends were not to be sourced in Chicago's north side neighborhoods. Rather, as Liesl Olsen explains, quote, the creative ferment of the city could be found in Bronzeville, end quote. This is where Speranziva turned in her mission to bring ballet into the avant-garde. The first performance of Fantasy Nagd took place in the downtown location of the Stevens Hotel Grand Ballroom. Price and Margaret Bonds accompanied, playing a two piano arrangement of the work. They were joined by singer Gladys Hayden Sims. According to the Chicago Defender, quote, her excellent voice filled the grand ballroom during the dancing, making a thrilling climax, end quote. The dance troupe's Afrocentric costumes were, as reported in the Chicago Defender, quote, direct to a princess effect to the ankles with black braided wigs and bare feet. End quote. The newspaper identified the performance as the beginning of a new era in the history of African American dance. Quote, as in the poetry and music of the race, the dance has outgrown the elementary period of spontaneous expression, which ignores the universal language of form and technique. Without the elementary period, the race dance would lack richness and individuality. With form and technique, it will endure in a universal medium and become part of the inheritance of all posterity." End quote. The word universal signaled enlightenment ideals in a Black Renaissance aesthetic. It encoded notions of assimilation and white acceptance, as well as contemporary thought around racial progress. While this also had the effect of infantilizing and primitivizing African-derived traditions, these were the tools for cultural ascension in, Jim, in the Jim Crow era. A common thread ran through the artistry of Bronzeville's practitioners. European-derived approaches to form and technique converged with diasporic African modes of extemporized expression, and what Price achieved in music, Dunham embodied in movement. Fantasy Nerd continued to shape Dunham's own explorations of rebirth and revitalization in Black vernacular dance. She was not simply a passive figure in Speranziva's vision. Dunham staged the ballet on several occasions through the 1930s with the Negro Dance Group. One documented performance took place on, in October 1933 at the Punch and Judy Theatre in the Loop. The program additionally featured ceremonial dances from Ashanti practitioners, songs from the Deep River Quartet and jazz from the singer pianist Fletcher Butler. Another performance of Fantasy Negra took place in 1936. British photographer Bertram Dorian Basabe captured the dancers in motion. To quote Liesl Olsen again, dance is notoriously difficult to archive. And there is little trace of the Fantasy Negra choreography beyond the Chicago Defenders reviews and Basabe's photograph. This image therefore provides a rare glimpse into the extent that Dunham and her troupe embodied Price's fantasy and staged the Black Renaissance imaginary throughout the age and city. I want to close with some reflections on the music of Margaret Bonds and the ways in which Catherine Dunham's legacy is felt in Bonds' music. Bonds was what I like to call a daughter of the Black Chicago Renaissance. Her musical voice absorbed the politics, poetry, rhythm, and blues that bloomed from Bronzeville. Like many Black Renaissance composers, Bonds was as much at home in the language of the Negro spirituals as she was in the conventions of the European classical tradition. Both were her cultural heritage, and we hear their glorious blend in her compositions. Her piano work, Troubled Water, which was composed in 1967, is based on the spiritual Wade in the Water. And just like Florence Price with Fantasy Neck, Bonds takes the spiritual melody and creates rich variations with rhythms that strongly suggest the influence of dance. And so, imagine my delight when I learned from the work of Bond scholar Louise Toppin that Troubled Water was originally called Group Dance. The image of Catherine Dunham's sinuous pose, mirrored by the surrounding dancers, immediately came to mind. 
In Margaret Bond's Troubled Water, the Black Renaissance imaginary lives on.
Samantha, that was amazing. Wow. Can you see me okay? Am I coming through? Okay, great. Um, it is such a pleasure to hear you both um, perform a piece in full, but also to have you step through a, a piece like La Gia Bless, which um, I listened to the, for the first time upstairs in special collections at the Newberry with, you know, um, uh, you know, ears that um, are, are not your ears. I mean, to have you play it and then, and then also um, give us um, um, some background on what's happening in terms of the movement on stage, the performers on stage during Still's piece is just really, really revelatory. And your acts of recovery, recovering this music, recording this music and, um, um, really presenting it for us, for new audiences now, um, it's just really um, to be applauded. It's uh, it, really incredible, incredible work. We have lots of questions in the Q&A and we're gonna definitely get to those. And if you have them and you wanna type them in the Q&A to our audience, please do. I wanna start with a question about the ways in which um, this music and performance um, was reviewed and received. Um, I was so struck by what you said about um, both Stills, um, La Gia Bless, um, and the ways in which you were describing it as um, um, a, a real kind of mix of jazz, late romanticism, and French impressionism. And yet the reviewer said, oh, these are African elements because it was new or it was, it was somehow other. And then um, that was, uh, you know, there's a point of comparison to be made in how Dunham and her dancers and that image of them and what looks like to me has always looked like to me a kind of Martha Graham de rigueur, you know, costuming that they too are, are described um, um, as, as I, I forget exactly the language that the reviewer uses, but um, somehow embodying a kind of um, African ancestry. Um, Help, help us understand that a little bit more. Well, with composers such as Florence Price and William Grant Still, they were classically trained. And so as, as a concert pianist, I hear the, the longer legacy of, um, of European classical music in what they're creating. In the, the, the time in which they're creating their music, however, because of being of African descent, there's the sense in which the, the kaleidoscopic breadth of their, of their style and of their influences is not fully um, received. And actually the scholar Jennifer Stover describes this as the sonic color line, um, basically hearings of race. And because of the of Jim Crow America and its racial regime, um, it wasn't just a, a visual color line that extended to how Black Americans were heard and uh, and misheard, misunderstood. And so, in in actually playing this music and and sitting at the piano and thinking about um, my own training and thinking about um, the different eras uh, with which I'm familiar, I try to identify that as much as possible in um, Price's and in Still's music and in Bond's music and any of the repertoire that I'm playing from this era because the, the German Romantic tradition, French Impressionism and um, so many styles that make up the Western canon were as much a part of their musical and cultural heritage as the Negro spirituals to which they felt very much connected as well. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, so, you know, the, you, the, the date on La Gia Bless is 1927. Is that right? Um, and then it's used in this performance in 1933 of the ballet La Gia Bless, which is the first time an all black cast performs in um, the Auditorium Theater and then later with Dunham in the lead role uh, at the Opera House. Really important moment in Chicago cultural history. Um, 33 and 34, through this collaboration between Ruth Page and Catherine Dunham, and I love your focus on all the collaborative work among these various different figures. One of our viewers has this question about um, uh, whether whether this music um, had performances beyond Chicago, you know, into the rest of the country. What's the legacy of this of this music being performed, you know, um, beyond the city? So the piece is originally for solo piano, 
and Price wrote a two piano arrangement and Margaret Bonds also performed this music in its two piano form and um, as a solo piece as well. We know that this piece was performed quite a few times in Chicago and actually this is the first of four fantasies um, titled Fantasy Neg. So this is a genre that Price continued with um, from 1929 to I think the final revision of her Final Fantasy was 1937. Um, in terms of nationwide performance, I haven't been able to find anything um, around that, unfortunately. Um, given the limited opportunities um, for women, in particular Black women in classical music, it was really up to the composers to perform the music, um, you know, themselves. And so I think that's why we can find more examples of Chicago performances um, with this piece. That makes sense. That makes sense. We have a couple questions from Susan Manning, dance scholar Susan Manning up at Northwestern. She asks, um, was the score for Fantasy Neg published or did Dunham rely on her personal encounter with Florence Price to know about the work's existence? From what I have read in the Price archives, um, Price considered her fantasy negra composition to be one of her most important works, but it was never published during her lifetime. Um, she wrote, um, she well, she hand wrote the score um, and had multiple copies that she circulated. Um, and so it was, um, I think a performance by Margaret Bonds that attracted um, the attention of Dunham and Spur and Ziva. Um, and if we imagine the many interactions that are happening, um, it was perhaps, um, you know, at one of the many musical soirees that were happening in Black Chicago that perhaps Dunham came across um, this work. Mm -hmm. That makes sense too. Um, so that relationship between the music and the performance or music and dance is at the heart of another question um, about whether you could speak more about dance as a gateway to these composers um, and maybe more about, you know, the audiences and the funding that um, supported or limited the work? I don't know much about um, the relationship between dance and um, what these composers were putting out, especially because to have dance accompany the music would have required um, more funding, um, more funding than what was available. Um, however, I do hear the influence of dance in this Black Renaissance school of composition, as I like to think of it. Um, with Price in particular, she wrote a number of works that uh, draw upon the juba, which was um, a plantation dance. And we hear this a lot in um, the small pieces that she wrote for her students and her, her symphonic works, um, particularly um, the one that had its premiere um, in 1933, um, the night before the ballet program as well. So dance is um, a huge influence, but in terms of staging dance alongside this music, that's not something that we see a lot of. So in some ways, um, because dance obviously requires a whole other set of um, people, performers, um, it's a more elaborate and presumably more, you know, um, uh, expensive venture to, to have both the um, the, the music and the dance together, right? Yes. Um, I was, um, I, there's another question I know I'm gonna get to definitely about um, uh, where we are today with, with um, black women composers, but I wanted to circle back to William Grant Still. You said that he was, um, he was blackballed or that politically he, he um, you know, got, got himself, I mean, people, people kind of um, didn't perform his, his work. Um, can you, Talk, talk to us a little bit more about that. Yes, well, William Grant still was very much aware that as a black composer, he was expected to sound a certain way. Right. And essentially, if he sounded um, in a way that was expected for his race, he would be pandering to stereotypes. Um, or if he sounded um, sort of more, um, dissonant in his music and, and there was a more sort of abstract overtone to it, he would be seen as um, avoiding 
his identity. Um, and he felt that when it came to using black idioms in music, uh, white composers were rewarded for that far more than black composers. And mm. he cited George Gershwin as an example of that. And another composer called John Powell, who was a white supremacist, but used black musical idioms and um, was very much praised and the Chicago Symphony performed his work. Um, interestingly, on the Negro in Music program where Price had her, um, her debut, John, pa John Powell's music was part of that. Um, it's this very disturbing uh, dissonance in that programming. So William Grant Still was very vocal about these issues and was ostracized as a result. Um, his daughter, Judith Ann Still, has done a lot to make sure that his music is available. And so the, the piece that I played, um, I ordered off the website that she runs and that music is available. Um, but he was programmed by the major orchestras of his time. And the fact that he isn't now um, is really evidence of the way that his legacy has been suppressed in the mainstream. Right, right. And what did his relationship with Dunham continue to, to be? Um, um, there was an earlier question about um, him possibly being involved in Stormy Weather, the, the, the um, you know, Hollywood film in which Catherine Dunham, she wasn't the star, but she was in it, that maybe he had been approached to do the music for that, but then didn't do it. Um, do you know that story at all? Unfortunately, I do yeah. know. I yeah. know that there were um, different stagings, though, of La Gia Bless um, through the 1930s, and that still was in Chicago. And, um, you know, those com those collaborations continued through that era, but I'm not... I'm not too sure about right, right. right. That and, and maybe you're overturning something that I always thought about um, uh, Ruth Page and Catherine Dunham and, and William Grant still in terms of this incredible uh, ballet that um, you know performed you know many times in the city in the 30s. I thought Ruth Page had asked William Grant still to compose the music for La Gia Bless, um, but did he actually compose it much earlier, kind of you know on his own terms? Um, do you know if that, uh, what the story is with that? I don't, but that was the impression that I had considering the, how many years passed between the original composition and its staging. Right. Okay. I see. I see. Um, so, um, you know, thinking about this history that, um, you are enriching and, and bringing to the forefront and performing and, and allowing for us to experience. Um, there is a, a question about, you know, present day black um, women composers. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about where we are now? Who's carrying forth this great music? I mean, we know you are, um, which is amazing. Who else? Well, um, a few years ago, I actually performed this music um, in the Chicago Cultural Center and um, invited the composers Regina Harris-Biocchi and Dolores White to come and hear the performance. And I programmed Florence Price and Margaret Bonds alongside that of uh, the music of Regina and Dolores. And they were composers who, um, well, Regina is still in Chicago and Dolores um, spent a lot of time in Chicago and almost had lessons from Florence Price. And so to have um, that performance take place in a space where Price and Bonds actually spent time um, and then to engage the music of composers from the next generation uh, was incredibly moving. And I think it really um, spoke to the theme of community and collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of composers today, um, and particularly con uh, continuing the themes of um, of the Black Renaissance aesthetic. Um, it's really interesting that the composer Courtney Bryan um, composed a piece that draws upon the spiritual wade in the water. Um, and we're hearing contemporary compositions where Black vernacular influences are still being um, seen as sources of inspiration. Mm. I, in my research, I, I am particularly interested in community um, and I use the past as a way of um, thinking about what it might mean um, to be a Black classical practitioner 
um, today. And in terms of my experience, what I'm really inspired by is um, the sense of network and the ways in which these women uplifted one another and played um, each other's music. And so while I am a musicologist, it is very important that I play this music um, because that's the way that we, we ensure that these legacies live on. Understood. Um, that's beautiful. And I, and I uh, very much look forward to actually hearing you perform in person. I think probably everybody tuning in right now does. That way, the ways in which you're underscoring female networks, that is certainly at the heart of the exhibition Chicago Avant-Garde, as you well know, the kind of um, networks, the influences, the overlap, the collaborations that happened in Chicago in an era that people don't necessarily consider um, as, as so rich with um, collaborative experimental work. Um, that, is, that, is, um, that is really at the heart of Chicago Avant-Garde. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with or um, um, flag for us um, coming up or uh, yet yeah, anything else? Uh, well, I have, I've written uh, two articles that actually came from my time at the Newbury Wonderful. on the subject. So if you would like to read more, um, the names of the articles are on my website. Um, and I can share as well that I will be writing a book about this incredible network and, and um, bringing in the narratives of Florence Price, Margaret Bonds, Catherine Dunham, and so many more women from um, the Black Chicago Renaissance. So uh, there's a lot to look out for. Um, thank you so much for the questions and the comments, um, especially comments on my dresses. I definitely appreciate oh, those. Gorgeous, gorgeous. <laughs> yes. Not pandemic wear, right? Um, it is absolutely stunning to listen to you and to watch you play. Thank you so much, Samantha, for joining us. Thank you, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.